Chapter 5 is going to be concerned with the types of qualitative approaches to doing research. Now, you remember from our previous discussion that qualitative research involves data that are words. Now, in qualitative research, remember that researchers do not control for variables. And data are collected in naturalistic settings. And the goal, remember, is to understand the phenomenon as those participants who are immersed in the experience. It's very important to remember that findings are not generalized outside of the study, as is done with qualitative research. And the sample size is usually smaller than in quantitative studies. Now, the data collection methods, and this applies to all forms of qualitative research, and we're going to look at several of them, involves interviews, observation. They can have texts, but usually they use open-ended questionnaires. Now, the data analysis may involve describing the phenomenon of concern, and we're going to find in grounded theory they use coding, and, and a lot of them interpretation is a method. Um, they usually come up with themes or patterns, and sometimes computer software programs are used to help assist the qualitative researcher. Now, the four methods of qualitative research that we're going to look at in this lecture include phenomenology, grounded theory, ethnography, and the historical method. Now, phenomenology is a process of learning and the construction of the meaning of human experience through extensive dialogue with persons who are living that experience. For example, a researcher may be interested in loss, so the purpose statement would be, the purpose of this study was to describe the lived experience of grieving the loss of a loved one. The goal of phenomenological research is to understand the meaning of the experience as it is lived by the participant, hence the lived experience. The researcher usually does purposive sampling. Now, as we know, this is not a method that should be used by quantitative research, but since qualitative research is not to be generalized, the process of sampling by hand-picking participants is just fine. In phenomenological research, the researcher's perspective is bracketed. Now, bracketed means that the researcher uses some strategy to identify his or her personal biases about the phenomenon of interest to, and to clarify how personal experiences and beliefs may color what is heard and reported. In my own research using the Parsi method, I accomplish this by first telling my readers what I believe about the idea of the phenomenon in which I am interested. Now, the phenomenological researcher usually audio tapes an interview. And just an FYI, for those of you budding researchers, always use two recorders, since there's always a glitch, and one of them usually fails. And if you only had one, you'd lose all of the data from your interview. Open-ended questions are usually used since they elicit the most information. For example, think about the question, Please tell me about your experience of loss. It is wide open as to what the person can tell you. Then think about these questions. Were you sad? Did you cry? Were you afraid of the future? Do you feel depressed? If you ask such pointed questions, you may be leading the participant. Wonder if there was some relief. Wonder if there was some happiness, especially if the death of a loved one was long and painful. You would not capture that information if you only asked your own pointed questions. Now remember that quantitative data collection is complete when saturation occurs. 
Now, the data analysis is completed through a thorough and sensitive reading of the participants' descriptions of the experience. Then significant phrases are pulled out and compared with the experience of other participants. Then similar statements are grouped together and they form the central part of the description of the lived experience. The final synthesis is an exhaustive description of the lived experience. So, in a nutshell, phenomenological research begins with the research question. Data is collected through samples of participants' stories. The data is interpreted by the researcher. And the final synthesis tells a story about the lived experience. Now, please review the article I have posted related to phenomenology and look for the purpose, type of data collection, data analysis, and read the findings. Now, grounded theory is a research method that produces a theory. It comes out of sociology and is about human social processes. It actually arises out of social interaction theory. The resulting theory should be useful in explaining, interpreting, and predicting phenomena. An example of a grounded theory research purpose would be, the purpose of this study was to enter into the world of those caregivers who provide care for their husband's parents and to explore their perceptions of the situation in the context of managing and providing care. Research questions that start the investigation can actually change and be refined as the data is collected and the researcher finds other phenomena that can be vital to the investigation. For example, if the researcher was investigating the process of providing care to in-laws and came upon the idea of cost as important, then questions about cost will be incorporated into the study. Usually, there is not an extensive literature review done when it comes to grounded theory because it may influence the researcher. This means that the theory must emer emerge per purely from the data that is collected. The purpose of sample is selected by asking people who are involved in a social process to participate. Now, a social process involves relationships between people that occur over time. For example, in the previous research purpose, it can be seen that the theory to emerge is about caregiving that involves family members and occurs over a period of time. Data are collected through interviews and skilled observation of the social process being investigated, and again, they usually use open-ended questions. Data collection and analysis occur simultaneously in this method. Now, compare that to quantitative, in which the data are collected and then analyzed. While collecting data and writing field notes, a grounded theory researcher um, keeps memos about hunches concerning the emerging patterns. Then the researcher follows up on those hunches. Using, using open coding, the researcher examines the data carefully, line by line, and breaks it down into discrete parts and compares it for similarities and differences. The process is called the constant comparative method. Sometimes it's indicated in the method section and clues you into the fact that it is a grounded theory study. The process continues when the codes are clustered to form categories and a core variable. Finally, there is the construction of a theory and a diagram is often created. Now, please pull up the article that I have posted for grounded theory and again review it for the purpose, type of data collection, the data analysis, and the findings. Now, the ethnographic method has a purpose, as they all do, which focuses on a cultural system. 
And the goal is to understand the way of life of individuals who are connected through group membership. Now remember, culture isn't always like the Hispanic culture or the East Asian culture. It can be any group that shares belief systems that are like. Now, the aim is to combine the emic view with the etic view. The emic view is the one from the participant, the M in that word meaning my, and the etic view is the one from the researcher, who is the outsider or their, which matches up with the T. I just want to make those two words clear because sometimes there's some confusion because they're kind of similar. Now, for ethnographic theory, identifying the phenomenon involves being interested in the world of the people who, you, who are being studied. It includes all cultural, political, economic, institutional, and social relational aspects. Ethnographic theory answers questions about how cultural knowledge, norms, values, and other contextual variables influence a phenomenon. For example, a health experience. The purpose of an ethnographic study would be, for example, the purpose of this study was to discover the care expressions, practices, and patterns of elderly Anglo-African American elders. Now remember, culture is viewed as a system of knowledge and linguistic expressions used by social groups. The researcher is an interpreter entering an alien world and attempting to make sense of that world from the insider's point of view, or emic. The researcher brackets his or her personal biases just like researchers who use phenomenology or grounded theory methods. Now, the sample is selected because they have special knowledge, status, or communication skills and are willing to teach the researcher about the group. They are known as key informants. Data collection and analysis take place in the natural setting with field work as a major focus. The interviews are often semi-structured, although they can use contrast question to further clarify the cultural phenomenon. Also, photographs or other objects may also be considered, and those are called artifacts. The data analysis occurs simultaneously and begins with a search for domains or symbolic categories that include smaller categories. The findings help to explain phenomenon within the cultural group. Now, once again, please go to the article that has been posted for ethnography and find the purpose, type of data collection, data analysis, and the finding. Now, historical research is a systematic approach for understanding the past through collection, organization, and critical appraisal of facts. The goal is to illuminate the past so it can guide the present and the future. The research question is often implicit in the phenomenon being studied. Now, data sources are the sample and usually are noted in the reference list. Primary sources are eyewitness accounts provided by varying sorts of communication appropriate to the time. For example, if it was earlier in the last century, they would probably be from letters or newspapers, where if we're looking at um, the time period now, it would be with tweets and Facebook. Secondary sources provide a view of the phenomenon from another's perspective rather than a first-hand account. Data sources are examined for authenticity, and this is also known as external criticism. Data collection can take from months to well into years. Now, a historical researcher must avoid the idea of present-mindedness. Present-mindedness means using a contemporary perspective when analyzing data collected from an earlier period. 
it can lead to inaccurate conclusions. So researchers must study each period within the context of its age to avoid judging or interpreting the past without respect to changes made over time. In the end, the presentation of a historical study should be logical, consistent, and easy to follow. Once again, please see the posting of a historical study for the purpose, type of data collection, data analysis, and the findings. Now, lest you think that qualitative research doesn't have standards, you would be wrong. Um, remember, standards for quantitative research were, was the sample representative? Did the design have internal validity? Was there reliability and validity for the measurement tools? Did they use the appropriate statistical methods? And all of those things that made for a very sound quantitative research study. Now there are standards for qualitative research. The first one, as with all, is ethics. And as with all studies, qualitative researchers must respect the rights of the participants by having the study approved by an IRB. Thus, the person will be assured that they have autonomy and that beneficence and justice as rights have been protected. Another standard for qualitative research involves credibility. That means the truth of the findings as judged by participants and others within the discipline. The researcher sometimes returns to the participants to share the interpretation of their findings to make sure that this is exactly what the participant said. But this doesn't occur in all types of qualitative research. Now, another standard has to do with auditability. This means that there's adequacy of information leading the reader from the research question and raw data to the interpretation of the findings. You should be able to follow the reasoning of the researcher step by step. And when you see in qualitative studies where they have pulled out direct quotes from participants, this is actually allowing you to audit the trail up to the findings. The final standard has to do with fittingness. That's the faithfulness to everyday reality of the participants described in enough detail so that others in the discipline can evaluate the importance of the study. The experience being reported should ring true. And this ends my little explanation on the types of qualitative research. And when you come to class, we will be able to discuss through our HOPE study um, the differences between qualitative and quantitative research methods.